Happy Wednesday. Hard to believe, but it is the day before Thanksgiving. And here I am at Story and Song sharing poetry with you. I may bring this into the picture every once in a while because I want to remind everybody where we are since we're in such a special place. Today is really very appropriate because what I have for you is when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. It's a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry, edited by Joy Harjo. Now, we actually did a unit on uh, Joy Harjo months ago, but this is the book that is right here on the shelves of Story and Song for your Christmas giving and delectation. It is astronomical. You can see from all these little markers I've put in here, I wish I had three hours of, of time to spend with you because it would be warranted by this anthology. There's so much goodness herein. I want to read to you two things from the book first. It starts with what's called a blessing. And it's by N. Scott uh, Mamaday, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And it is a poem, but there's a little scribbit before it, which says, this anthology is a most welcome addition to American literature. The Native Americans have always been deeply invested in language, the songs, spells, and prayers of the native oral tradition are among the world's richest examples of verbal art. The present collection is a comprehensive celebration of that tradition and that art. Prayer for words. My voice restore for me, Diné. Here is the wind bending the reeds westward, the patchwork of morning on gray moraine. Had I words I could tell of origin, of God's hands, bloody with birth at first light, of my thin squeals in the heat of his breath, of the taste of being, the bitterness and sense of camas root and choke berries. And God, if my mute heart expresses me, I am the rolling thunder and the bursts of torrents upon rock, the whispering of old leaves, the silence of deep canyons. I am the rattle of mortality. I could tell of the splintered sun. I could articulate the night sky. Had I words. And now from the introduction, I'm just going to read you some snippets. Um, and I would encourage you to read the entirety of this because it's very informative. I learned so much from, from reading the introduction. This is by Joy Harjo. We begin with the land. We emerge from the earth of our mother and our bodies will be returned to earth. We are the land. We cannot own it, no matter any proclamation by paper state. We are literally the land, a planet. Our spirits inhabit this place. We are not the only ones. We are creators of this place with each other. We mark our existence with our creations. It is poetry that holds the songs of becoming, of change, of dreaming, 
and it is poetry we turn to when we travel those places of transformation, like birth, coming of age, marriage, accomplishments, and death. We sing our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, our human experience in time, into and through existence. The anthology, then, is a way to pass on the poetry that has emerged from rich traditions of the very diverse cultures of indigenous peoples from these indigenous lands to share it. Most readers will have no idea uh, that there is or was a single native poet, let alone the number included in this anthology. We are more than 573 federally recognized indigenous tribal nations in the mainland United States. 231 are located in Alaska alone. Now that number doesn't include the indigenous peoples of Hawaii, the uh, Kanakam Malawi, whose nation numbers over 500,000, and the indigenous peoples of Guahan and America Samoa. We speak more than 150 indigenous languages. At contact with European invaders, we were estimated at over 112 million. By 1650, we were fewer than 6 million. Today, we are one half of 1% of the total population of the United States. Imagine the African continent with one half of 1% of indigenous Africans, and you might understand the immensity of the American Holocaust. There is no such thing as a Native American, nor is there a Native American language. We call ourselves Muskoki, Dine, or any of the other names of our tribal nations. In many cases, these names often translate as the people. Within our communities, we know each other as bird, wind, or panther, or by other nomenclature determined by the particular tribal band, ceremonial, ground, or family. Some of us grew up with the term American Indian, which came into use after the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus sailed into the region that came to be called the West Indies on his heavily financed trip to discover a shorter route for trade to India. America is a derivative of the name of the Italian explorer and cartographer, map maker, Amerigo Vespucci. He proved that the West Indies and Brazil were not India, but what became known as the New World. Native American became ubiquitous in the 1990s, <clears throat> employed by academics to replace American Indian. Only the youngest generations of natives have begun to use that term. None of the original treaties signed with the federal government use the term Native American, native or indigenous or native nations are uh, where we have settled in the editing of this collection. Many tribal nations have reclaimed or are reclaiming their original names. One of the first was Papago, now, who now use their original name, Tohano Odham. Many 
tribes mean, name, mean, enemy, in the language of their enemy. For example, Sioux is a French name adopted by the English that was derived from an Ojibwe name that meant little snakes. Because we respect indigenous nations' rights to determine who is a tribal member, we have included only indigenous nations' voices that are enrolled tribal members or are known and work directly within their respective communities. We give thanks to those who kept culture going, kept the arts and poetry going. You know, until 1978, cultural tribal nation expression was outlawed. It wasn't until the passing of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978 that we were free to practice our indigenous cultures in the United States. This act included but did not limit access to sacred sites, freedom to worship through ceremonial and traditional rites, and use and possession of sacred objects. We did not have organized religion, per se. Rather, the, the whole earth is a sacred site. A poem can be considered a sacred site in which so much of our culture is stored, made into form to be acknowledged, given a place, even a place to hide. Many of our oldest and most traditional poems and songs contain maps of the stars, road maps, or precepts of spiritual knowledge. We acknowledge the source of poetry, those who agreed to create the poetry in which to hold meaning with words, and those poets who kept and keep it going despite history. Muto, Yakoki. Thank you to all who brought this collection together from far back in time to the present. And now for some poems, but a bit about the poet first. Emily Pauline Johnson. As a daughter of a Mohawk chief and his English wife, Emily grew up learning both English and Mohawk language and literature. An author of fiction as well as poetry, she published in journals and anthologies in Canada and the United States and Great Britain, as well as in volumes of her own work. She was born in 1861, died in 1913, Mohawk. Her poem, Marshlands. A thin wet sky that yellows at the rim and meets with sun lost lip the marshes brim. The pools low lying dank with moss and mold, glint through their mildews like large cups of gold. Among the wild rice in the still lagoon, in monotone, the lizard shrills his doom. The wild goose homing seeks a sheltering where rushes grow and oozing lichens cling late cranes with heavy wing and lazy flight sail up the silence with the nearing night and like a spirit swathed in some soft veil 
steals twilight and its shadow o'er the swale. Hushed lie the sedges, the vapors creep thick, gray, and humid, while the marshes sleep. Can you picture that? Christos, born in 1946. Hey, he's a year older than me. He is a two-spirit activist poet born in San Francisco. Her poetry collection, which focus on feminism, social justice, and native rights, include Not Vanishing and Dream On and Firepower. And what I'm going to read to you is one of my favorites. Ceremony for completing a poetry reading. This, this is a giveaway poem. You've come gathering, made a circle with me of the places I've wandered. <laughs> I give you the first daffodil opening from earth that I've sown. I give you warm loaves of bread baked in soft mounds like breasts. In this circle I pass each of you a, a shell from our mother sea. Hold it in your spirit. Hear the stories she'll tell you. I've wrapped your faces around me, a warm robe. Oh, let me give you ribbon work leggings, dresses sewn with elk teeth, moccasins woven with red and sky blue porcupine quills. I give you blankets woven of flowers and roots. Come closer. I have more to give. Oh, this basket is very large. I've stitched it of your kind words. Oh, here, here is a necklace of feathers and bones. A sacred meal of chokeberries. Take this mask of bark, which keeps out the evil ones. This basket is only the beginning. There is something in my arms for all of you. I offer this memory of, of sunshine seen through ice crystals. Here, an afternoon of looking into the sea from high rocks. Here, a red-tailed hawk circles over our heads. One of her feathers drops for your hair. May I give you this round stone which holds an ancient spirit? This stone will soothe you. Within this basket is something you've been looking for all your life. Come, take it. Take as much as you need. I give you seeds of a new way. I give you the moon shining on a fire of singing women. I give you the sound of our feet dancing 
I give you the sound of our thoughts flying. I give you the sound of peace moving into our faces and sitting down. This is a give-away poem. I cannot go home until you have taken everything and the basket which held it. When my hands are empty, I will be full. I love that poem. <laughs> William Bearhart, born in 1979 from St. Croix, earned an MFA from Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. And in addition to writing and editing, Bearheart works as a poker dealer at a small casino in Wisconsin. His poetry has been published in the Boston Review, Prairie Schooner, North American Review, Tupelo Quarterly, and PANK Magazine. His poem. When I was in Las Vegas and saw a Warhol painting of Geronimo, you know, I thought we could be related, Andy and I. We're uh, both blue walls and yellow cows in a gallery of pristine white. We're both screen prints, offset and layered, underexposed, we're both silver clouds filled with helium and polluted rain. We're both white and blonde and scared of hospitals. Only I'm not really any of those things. And then I thought we could be related. Uh, Geronimo and I, we're both code names for assassinations. We're both first names you yell when you jump from a plane. We're both gamblers and dead and neon acrylic brush strokes on screen printed image. Only I'm more like a neon beer sign sputtering in a tavern window, burned out broke, a heart with a rhythmic beat. Elsie Fuller, Omaha, is a poet who attended the Hampton Institute in Hampton, Hampton, Virginia from 1885 to 1888. A new citizen. Now I am a citizen. Uh, they've given us new laws, uh, just as we've made by Senator Dawes. We need not live on rations. Why? There is no cause. For Indians are citizens, said Senator Dawes. Just give us a chance. We never will pause till we are good citizens like Senator Dawes. Now we are citizens. We all uh, give him applause. So three scenes, three cheers, my friends, for Senator Dawes. Gertrude Simmons Bonin, 1876 through 1938. Dakota was a writer, editor, musician, teacher, political activist, and co-founder and president of the National Council of American Indians in 1926. The Red Man's America. Listen to this carefully. My country, tis to thee, sweet land of liberty. 
My pleas I bring, land where our fathers died, whose offspring are denied the franchise given wide. Hark, while I sing, my native country thee. Thy red man is not free, knows not thy love, political red ills. Peyote in temple hills, his heart with sorrow fills, knows not thy love. Let Lane's bill swell the breeze, and ring from all the trees sweet freedom's song. Let Gandhi's bill awake all people till they quake. Let Congress silence break, the sound grow long. Great mystery to thee, life of humanity. To thee we cling. Grant our homeland be bright. Grant us just human right. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. Suzanne Shaun Harjo. Not the Harjo who was the editor, but another. She was born in 1945. Southern Cheyenne, Hodolgi, Muskogee, served as a congressional liaison for Indian affairs in the administration of President Jimmy Carter, later served as executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. The song called White Antelope's Chant. White Antelope had a song. It was a tistas song. It was his song because he sang it. Clouding Woman had a song. It was a tistas song. It was her song because she sang it. Buffalo Walla had a song. It was a tistas song. It was her song because she sang it. Boo Bear had a song. It was a tistis song. It was his song because he sang it. The song that sang itself had a tistis song and a truth for all who heard it at the hour of the end. The song that sang itself had no language. It was a heartbeat that thundered through the canyons of time. The song that sang itself had no chorus. Its voice was the morning star and the rain at the edge of time. The song that sang itself had no time, knew no season. It sounded with the power of the end. The song sang a tistis man in prayers, in the sun, in the sighs of the wind, in the power of the end. The song sang a tistis woman in the offerings at dawn, in the sighs of the wind, in the power of the end. The song sang a tistis child in the cries in the night in the sighs, in the wind, in the power of the end. The song sang a tis-tis-tis sound in the peace before dark, in the sighs on the wind, in the power of the end. Only Mother Earth endures, sang the man. Only Mother Earth endures sang the woman. Only Mother Earth endures, sang the child. Only Mother Earth 
endures, sang the psalm. Only Mother Earth endures. Oh, and now this, most unusual. Vince Wanase, Umatilla, 1936, he was born, died in 2017, was a poet, writer, artist, and a community worker. After some years on Skid Row, he began writing and published in many anthologies including Dancing on the Rim of the World, an anthology of contemporary Northwest Native American writing. He mentored many people in the Native community in the Portland, Oregon area. Forgotten Coyote Stories. A long time ago, when I was a kid, I lived with my uncle and aunt. My uncle rode with Joseph when he was a kid. I mean, my uncle, not Joseph. Uncle used to tell us kids coyote stories. Some were funny, some weren't. My mother took us from uncle and aunt. She put us in a Catholic boarding school. At school, I told some of the coyote stories. The sister said, don't believe those stories, but uh, believe us about a guy who waves a stick and the seas open, walks on water, who dies and comes back to life again, who ascends up into the sky. I used to believe all those stories. I don't anymore. Now, I wish I could remember those coyote stories. Uncle told me. The Summer of Black Widows by Sherman Alexie. He was born in 1966, Spokane. Uh, he's an award-winning and nationally recognized poet, novelist, and short story writer, whose honors include an American Book Award, and a National Book Award for Young People's Literature, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. The Summer of Black Widows. The spiders appeared suddenly after that summer rainstorm. Some people still insist the spiders fell with the rain, while others believe the spiders grew from the damp soil like weeds with eight thin roots. The elders knew the spiders carried stories in their stomachs. We tucked our pants into our boots when we walked through the fields of fallow stories. An Indian girl opened the closet door and a, a story fell in, into her hair. We lived in the shadow of a story trapped in the ceiling lamp. The husk of a story museumed on the windowsill. Before sleep, we shook our blankets and stories fell to the floor. A story floated in a glass of water left on the kitchen table. We opened doors slowly and listened for stories. The stories rose on hind legs and offered their red bellies to the most beautiful Indians. 
Stories in our cereal boxes, stories in our firewood, stories in the pockets of our coats. We captured stories and offered them to the ants, who carried the stories back to their queen. A dozen stories per acre. We poisoned the stories and gathered their remains with broom and pear. The spiders disappeared suddenly after that summer lightning storm. Some people will insist the spiders were burned to ash, while others believe the spiders climbed the lightning bolts and became a new constellation. The elders knew the spiders had left behind bundles of stories. Up in the corners of our old houses, oh, we still find those small white bundles and nothing, neither fire, no water, neither rock, no wind can bring them down. Ophelia Zepeda earned her PhD <clears throat> from the University of Arizona, and she writes, Ocean Power. Words cannot speak your power. Words cannot speak your beauty. Grown men with dry Fear in their throats. Watch the water come closer and closer. The driver tells them it's just the ocean. It won't get you. Watch it. It will roll away again. Men who had never seen the ocean, it was hard not to have the fear that sits in the pit of the stomach. Why did they bring us this way? Other times we crossed on the desert floor, that land of, of hot, dry air where the sky ends at the mountains, that land that we know, that land where the ocean has not touched for thousands of years. We do not belong here, this place, with the sky too endless. This place with the water too endless. This place with air too thick and heavy to breathe. This place with the roll and the roar of thunder always playing to your ears. We are not ready to be here. We are not prepared in the old way, we have no medicine. We have not sat and had our minds walk through the image of coming to this ocean. We are not ready. We have not put our minds to what it is we want to give to the ocean. We do not have cornmeal, feathers, nor do we have songs and, and prayers ready. We have not thought what gift we will ask from the ocean. Should we ask to be song chasers? Should we ask to be rain makers? Should we ask to be good runners? Or should we ask to be heartbreakers? No, we are not ready to be here at this ocean. And she also wrote, bury me with a band. My mother used to say, bury me with a band. And I'd say, I don't think the grave will be big enough. Instead, 
We buried her with creosote bushes and a few worldly belongings. The creosote is for brushing her footprints away as she leaves. It is for keeping the earth away from her sacred remains. It is for leaving the smell of the desert with her to remind her of home one last time. Alexander Posey, who was a Muskoki, I love this. To give you a little background, I love hummingbirds. In the summer, in the highlands, there's a porch that has a hummingbird feeder on it. And I have sat absolutely engaged for an hour, just watching the hummingbirds come. And I just stumbled on this poem that I have to share with you from Alexander Posey, who was a poet, humorist, and journalist, who politically was politically involved in improving living conditions in Indian territory. To a hummingbird, now here, now there, air posed, somewhere, in sensuous air, I only hear, I cannot see, the matchless winds that beareth thee. Art thou some frenzied poet's thought, that God embodied and forgot? Oh, now you all remember William, William Shakespeare, Hamlet, to be or not to be. Now listen to this. To a lot or not to a lot. To a lot or not to a lot. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the country to lie in common as it is, or divide it up and give each man his share pro rata, and by dividing end this sea of troubles, to a lot divide, perchance to end in statehood. Ah, there's the rub. Apologies to William. And this final poem is from Joy Harjo. She was Miss Koki, Koki, a poet, musician, and I said was, but I meant is. She's still with us. A writer, playwright, performer, and was appointed the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States in 2000. And 19. This is rabbit is up to tricks. In a world long before this one, there was enough for everyone until somebody got out of line. We heard it was rabbit fooling around with clay and when everybody was tired of his tricks and no one would play with him. He was lonely in this world. So Rabbit thought to make a person. And when he blew into the mouth of the crude figure to see what would happen, the clay man stood up. Rabbit showed the clay man how to steal a chicken. Clay man obeyed. Rabbit showed him how to steal corn. The clay man obeyed. Then he showed him how to steal someone's wife. <laughs> the clay man obeyed. Rabbit 
felt important and powerful. Play man felt important and powerful. And once that clay man started, he could not stop. Once he took that chicken, he wanted all the chicken. And once he took that corn, he wanted all the corn. And once he took that wife, he wanted all the wives. He was insatiable. Then he had a taste of gold. And he wanted all the gold. Then it was land and anything else he saw. His wanting only made him want it more. Soon it was countries, then it was trade. The wanting infected the earth. We lost track of the purpose and the reason for life. We began to forget our songs. We forgot our stories. We could no longer see or hear our ancestors or talk with each other across the kitchen table. Forests were being mowed down all over the world and rabbit had no place to play. Rabbit's trick had backfired. Rabbit to call the clay man back. But when the clay man wouldn't listen, ah, Rabbit realized he'd made a clay man with no ears. Oh, you have such journeys, prayers and blessings ahead. And now please have a very safe Thanksgiving, a joyous one, and find pleasure in your own company during these hard times. Until I speak with you again on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, and share some prose with you, stay well, eat well, be joyful. Till then. <laughs>